Yay. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Nice to see you. Um, who hasn't been to the Freeport recently, or who doesn't know how to do the Freeport stuff? Great, so we're going to do a couple of things before we get started. Um, to get the right mindset before we start talking about this wheel of life, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, we just want to get out of the mindset of outside this building, whatever we brought in, and try and just let go of that for the next couple of hours while we think about different things. Uh, things that brought us here in the first place, yeah? Or wants that brought us here in the first place. And to do that traditionally, we do a bunch of stuff with the altar and then we did the prostrations and the rest. We try and have the motivation that um, we're entering uh, a better state of mind before we sit here. So, uh, to do that more formally, we're going to do a couple of prayers. And the first thing is called the mandala offering. We're just imagining a perfect universe. And uh, that gets something happening in your hand if you don't have the right memories. Like that, and we'll over the next six weeks you get to practice it so you get those two thumbs that way. <laughs> and then those two fingers that way. And then the point in the middle is uh, supposed to be the top of Mount Meru or the center of the universe. You imagine everything as perfect as we can. And here are the words to uh, here are the words to the mandala offering in Tibetan. So we go. Uh, <laughs> your sensation, the sensation of the tip of your nose as the breath goes in and out, and then you feel it straight, your back is straight, you feel comfortable, there's no tension in the posture. You count the breaths, and in-breath, you count the breaths, and you count the breaths, and in-breath is a one, and an out-breath is an and, and an in-breath is a two. And try and focus just on the sensation at the tip of your nose without any focus on any other straight thoughts that come into your mind straight forward comes in, you start counting that one again and try and get up to seven or ten. We'll do that for a little bit.
just be thinking about the motivation of what brought you here today. What answers you want to get to help you to work with what you wish to be fixed. I can't think of the most perfect being you can imagine. If you have a guru or a super teacher, if you have an ideal perfect being, you can just bring them into your mind, into the front of you, or a feeling that they're around. Possible to have a mind that's perfect. To bring that consciousness into that mind. And uh, that down to the connecting with some softer things. And get to that smile to connect with you as we begin to enter the space where. the greatest negativity or negative feeling you had today or action that you did or thought that you had that you wish you hadn't done. Something that if you'd had a second chance you wouldn't have done. Think of that with some sense of regret. Knowing that whatever that was is now in your mind and you'll have to experience that in some form in the future. And with that, turn that into Let's do the opposite of that and think of the greatest thought or action or thing you said today. I think that would bring you the greatest joy, some goodness towards another person or yourself. That sense of heart, if you have a sense of that positive feeling in your mind or your life, that that would spiral upwards. some other person that you know, a close family or friend who's also done some goodness in their life and you feel some happiness for them, that they are having a positive life experience, that they've done some goodness that you may think of them. And you're sharing that joy for those other people who've got more than one chance to use with them. And generally help you get realizations that get you to a better place mentally so your experience of life gets better and you're able to help those around you have a better experience of life. As you ask them to please teach you and guide you. Ask them to stay and watch them float above the cloud of your head and become smaller and smaller facing the same direction through their presence, their light emanates above you. A strong sensation that they are present. Whether it's them up there or the quality of them in your mind, some feeling that they are there, that there's a goodness that you're about to enter. And that will stay for at least two hours. So the wheel of life, who knows, uh, who knows some things about the wheel of life? Can I ask? I'm 
really excited to, to talk about and learn about the business people and not just not much about headquarters. So I get to play with drawings and point to pictures. <laughs> um, we started with some great foreign art. Um, we got some books to sign for you to use and take away, but they came back half the size. So I don't know what foreign art that is, that we should have, that we should have these tiny, tiny books about images. So, <laughs> this, uh, these are for you, uh, we'll, everything that we'll cover today and over the next six weeks will be in this booklet, so uh, write really tiny, <laughs> but enjoy it. Um, we'll see if, if we need to, I can send you a PDF of the larger version. Um, before we start, I'd like to do something that might not be common to do in, in a Dharma class, but I'd like to focus on your motivation and your expectations for being here, if I may. Uh, I want you to think about it. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes, so if you're comfortable just thinking about it, um, I'd like to think about what is it that you're really looking for when you come here? To talk about this wheel of life. What was it that brought you to listen? And there are levels of depth, depth about this. It might be okay, I'm interested in some art painting, I'm interested in general in Buddhism, I'm interested to hear an Australian accent. <laughs> with a South African twist, you know. <laughs> um, but the thing is, the deeper you look, the more that you connect to that thing in you that will then create something either magical, medium or boring, or terrible out of the next six weeks. Because I'm just going to be going blah, 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 up here and pointing to some colors and shapes behind me that for some people will have a lot of meaning. And for other people, will just be, eh, that's interesting. Which proves that it doesn't come from that stuff. So I want to start with that. I want you to really try and connect with that thing in you. Your 50% of the interaction over the next six weeks. Because that will make the experience so much more alive and vivid and sharp for you. I mean, I wish that you could get as excited. I'm going to try and hold back my excitement about the wheel of life because I'm going to get all jumpy get off the cushion and want to draw stuff and the rest. It's an interesting topic because um, a, little, a little bit about me, I grew up in South America, I was born there when I was really young. But you know, I, I, I grew up a Catholic boy and really simplistic ideas I think I had in my childhood, you know, good and bad good and bad, you know, uh, fight and love, and, you know, these extremes for me. And so I never thought of myself as, as somebody who can have some kind of intellectual experience of things, let alone get past high school. And, and then I met this dude called Geshe Michael Roach, who, you know, started talking in Tibetan and Russian and all these other things. And, and uh, he made it possible for me to engage with um, a philosophy that gave me the idea that I could be a didactic person, I could actually study, that I could somehow think of things intellectually rather than experientially, so I could later on have a different experience. Right? <laughs> so um, I guess that the reason I'm telling you about that, the exciting thing about the Wheel of Life, it's simplistic for me. It covers all of Buddhism in a picture. And it can contain as much depth as a thing called the Lam Rim. So we'll go through that. But as we go through that, I'd like to get your 50% interacting, uh, at least for the beginning of the course, to actually hear what it is that you're looking to get and see if not I can pitch to that when I'm talking about certain elements of, of the painting. So this is very important that you fill in the dots of, your, uh, of who you're going to become. <laughs> After the six weeks, this might be your dots that you need to fill out. I'm just going to give you <laughs> some. I'm just going to give you some outline, some words that point to stuff. But what that means to you, I can't make that, you know. And you can only make that exciting and vibrant and alive if you are aware of what you're looking for, and then light that up on fire, so you can actually get that excitement about this content, turn it alive for you and. Use it for a practical experience in your everyday life. That's what the wheel of life is, is about. 
It's about making this stuff meaningful for the 24 hours that you're breathing on the planet as the planet goes around the sun. So hopefully after this, my goal is to project out there from my perspective as much of this stuff that is meaningful, that can touch you and can impact you, but I can't make it stick because you're not complete. You, you, you need some dots. Right, so can I just walk around the room, and I don't know all of you, so um, think about it. Um, what is it that you're looking for? I'm going to ask you to articulate it, to say it. And then I'm going to challenge you and go, no, deeper, a little bit deeper. And really, the level of honesty and openness that you show today will really set the scene for the next six weeks for you. Not, not just for the entire class, but for you. And that would make it whether you walk out of here going, Wow, I've just had an amazing experience. Oh, but uh, Australian accent wasn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, neutral. And nothing really changed. Hopefully you'll get something that you could use that's practical, that can change. All depends on what connects the dots for you. So I'm going to start with John. Oh. <laughs> what, what is it you're looking for? Interesting. Um, at this point in my practice, I'm just looking for any teachings to, to deepen, uh, deepen my understanding of Dharma. Yeah. Um, to, so that I can help all beings escape suffering. Uh, and see them. Okay, so you're looking to see them to this directly. This is his goal. See them to this directly. <laughs> And deepening his understanding of the Dharma, right? Of these uh, ideas that we somehow all got stuck with. Yeah? And that's why we're in this room together, right? Hi. Oh, hi. I'm Yelena. Um, I'm here to deepen my understanding of karma and emptiness, to see emptiness directly, and to use my life to help others. To use you. So I'm going to try and make it as practical as possible, yeah? Uh, it's awesome that you can see everything directly. It's a really good thing. <laughs> uh, making it practical is what I'm hoping to make uh, out of this. Yeah. Um, hello. Hi. No, no, you can. No, no, I was going to say, he's not the person. Well, um, and loud enough for the. A year ago, I asked my teachers if there was a drawing that explained Buddhism, <laughs> and they looked at me like. Have they heard the Wheel of Life? <laughs> and I was like, no. And then I met Hector like a month later and he was talking about the Wheel of Life and here we are a year later and I'm sitting and I'm learning about the Wheel of Life. Okay, that's awesome. So she's made this happen, but yeah, it wasn't me. <laughs> <Or> you. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think that um, the use of like allegory and metaphor and archetypes in our lineage is so powerful, and I think that um, I'm definitely looking to deepen my understanding of those archetypes to be able to understand concepts on a deeper level myself, and also be able to take those kinds of archetypal stories and um, use that as an avenue to teach other people in, in more concrete terms, and I think that um, the, the use of visuals is really grounding for esoteric ideas and themes. Right. Um, and then also to be able to see connections in other, um, like in other mythos, like in other um, cultures and other representations. Because I think that um, I, I have not I have a I just have a notion that um, there's continuity. Awesome. I highly encourage each of you to listen to each other and care for each other's words. Yeah, and as you're saying them, think of the people listening because we're going to be stuck together for six weeks. Something magic could happen between us because we're looking for stuff that's similar. I love that the metaphors and the, and the imagery. That's one of the things that gets me excited about. Is uh, many people familiar with Joseph Campbell? Yeah, right. Um, and he, he's incredible at connecting these mythologies and these stories and these rites of passages. And when you look at the Wheel of Life from that perspective, you can connect to many other traditions. You know, 
how across the globe, from major religions to the stories told in American Indian stories and, you know, Inca tales and the rest. So, um, I'm going to... I'm going to spend a bit of time in this first motivation part because it sets the tone for how we're going to get what we're going to get out of the next couple of weeks, right? Thank you. Right. So you've got other traditions, and uh, obviously you study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Awesome. Well, I hope you get that. I mean, it's good that you say that because uh, the essence of the will of life is to heal. Yeah. So uh, at a big level. Yeah. So <laughs> hopefully. So we'll see if we can do that for you. Yeah. I'll just order it in. Hi, <laughs> Chief. <laughs> Yeah, 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 it's pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a big pizza pie, but <laughs> if you're really hungry. No, no, thank you. Yeah, so uh, she said, understand things around you, right? You're a scientist, and I'm really scared when scientists come to the classes, because I don't know what to say to them, because they go, no, that's wrong. You know? and it's in my head. But, um, <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Hi, I'm Charles. Hi, Charles. And um, when you get everyone so eloquently stated a reason the spectrum. Um, I haven't been here in a while. I completed Bach Chir Pod 1 a little while back. And I come from practicing Vipassana meditation program. And it was a little too mellow for me to going to the teacher, uh, to going to have a mainline idea. And I sort of backed off a little bit and meditated someplace else. But um, I, I want to deepen my, my experience. benefit in my life and um, increasingly in my interaction personally and professionally and so forth. And I want to continue to develop that and um, deeper understanding of that mechanism in the dependency. Awesome. Yeah, so with the links, uh, 12 links we'll talk about interdependency in, in detail. And look, you'll see how the images in this in this painting uh, mark certain types of practice, yeah, and they are guides, much like this is an unfinished picture, you know, um, it, I know, it's my silliness, sorry, <laughs> you know, uh, you get to fill in the dots of your experience with markers that are metaphors to, to other things, you know, they're, they're not real things, they're metaphors to things, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Yoritza. Your pizza, don't forget it. Yeah, I forget it. Your yeah, pizza, that's totally fine. <laughs> Your pizza. Uh, the reason why we are here today is just to try to understand the differences between these two worlds the world of the living world and the inner world. Wow. I'm just so good. That's, that's the reason why we are here. Great. Think about how that works. Connect the dots. How to reach the dots. Between the outer world and the inner world, yeah? yeah. Ah. You might get something this first class. Yeah. <laughs> Just those words. <laughs> thanks for coming and thanks for, sh for sharing your perspective and thanks for listening to the other people. It really makes a difference to how we connect over the next six weeks and I'll keep harping on it, but it's your 50% of the transaction is vital if you're going to walk away with anything meaningful for you. Hi. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Hi. I've got a great joke about your name. But I'm <laughs> <Okay. Yeah. laughs> um. I don't, I don't know much about this piece of imagery, but it's beautiful, and I would love to learn more about it. And I've had some teachers talk about it a little bit, and I've seen some of the image, and so I'm just it's great. very yeah. curious. It's beautiful to see the variances. When you, when you know what you're looking for, yeah. you see so many Wheel of Life around the place. Yeah. Uh, in fact, every Dharma Center is supposed to have one. Every monastery is yeah. supposed to have one. Uh, for a reason, we'll talk about that a little today. You know, right? Um, so it's, it's good that you're just open to seeing what's in the image. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yeah, that's exactly why. <laughs> so I um, I feel like I'm still taking baby steps with Buddhism, but I know what a powerful practice it is. And so I'll go through these periods where I'll be meditating and I'll feel my mind start to turn and like sort of amazing things and selections on one and two. So some kind of pretty amazing things in my life. But for some reason, I'll just kind of fall off the wagon. I'm like, I know it's so amazing, and then I stop doing it. So I'm hoping that this class will kind of light my hair on fire. I need right. like <laughs> somebody to sort of help me, like push me to stay on. I don't know why.
items that I'll just kind of stop and all of a sudden I'll be like just kind of lost and I can show them this and I come back and I'm like it's still here it hasn't gone anywhere I'm here you know oh. so okay, a little so. bit of pushing to stay on to stay focused focus okay yeah you certainly have very clear points of interest that we can focus on specific things about practice hello hi my name is Gloria hi Gloria I mean, the world is happening around us, right? And then you know, all of us are trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Um, this is just one way to look at what the hell is going on. Yeah. It, now it happens to be extremely detailed, and and people have had incredible transformational experiences because of this thing. We'll talk about that. It's just one way of figuring out what the hell is going on. So hopefully you get that. You know. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Sue, and I absolutely love Buddhism. I mean, I love, there's nothing about it that doesn't make sense to me. And I see this all over the place. I have no idea what I'm looking at, and I was just talking to him. I didn't even realize, like, it's a different realms. I mean, I'm just a little <laughs> slow, I guess. <laughs> I also want to learn about the art, you know, and the symbolism. Yeah. Like, even, I know everything in it has symbolism. Like, yeah. the clouds have meaning. And I really want to learn about it. I see it all over. So. Me too. That's yeah. why I'm here. I've got no <laughs> idea what's going on. And yeah. I figured the only way to learn it is to teach it. So mm. I'm not kidding. Mm -hmm. I really have no idea. No, no. I didn't. <laughs> 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 but, you know, it wasn't my idea. It's, uh, we'll talk about where the ideas came from. We've got um, people that have invested lifetimes. Sure. Like their breaths have gone from their bodies for a lifetime. 40, 50, 60, 70 years thinking about this thing and putting it together. So a bunch of strangers can come into a room and think about what it means for them to make sense of their world. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can we can become some kind of experts because really the, with the information we're going to get is incredibly precious. When you, when you come to class by class two or three, you'll get a sense of the depth and the levels of depth that's behind these lines on a painting. I mean, it's just little symbols. But then to add significance and depth that can have really blow your brain open to experience um, can be an incredible feeling. Um, Sam, there's something with that. Um, who did I miss? You're, you're, you came in. We're just talking about what we're expecting out of the course. So I make sure I cover everybody. Uh, so expectations most more than anything, and also I'm a snowsy parker. So. <laughs> oh, no. I'm Shirley Sam. Hi, um, Teresa. I've been coming to Rejo for a few months, and I don't know if you're aware, I'm just part of the thing for some years, but yes. he kind of told me, you have a night in hand of doing mystic classes, and so I, I really had no idea. I just wanted to get that. You've got the jackpot. <laughs> it's really like it's the best class in town. Yeah. At seven o'clock tonight. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm gonna be late. I work till seven, so that's, I'm running down here. That's fine. You miss all the good stuff. We talk about you before you came. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just open. Yeah, that's the best way to be. That's fantastic. Hello. Hi. Last one. Uh, hi, I'm Keith. Um, I came here at a friend Sam's suggestion. Um, I've been kind of exploring. I guess seven or eight years now, it's kind of informally, but it's my first time doing it. So you're going to have a quick summary on this thing called the Wheel of Life. Let's see if I uh, missed any of it. So we're going to do six classes. We've talked about why we're here, your motivation. It's important that you do your 50%. Think about those things you said and go to a deeper layer still each time you come or each time you think about the content. And I'll do my best to do my 50% of the equation and try and put it in terms that make sense or apply to what you're looking for. Did I miss anybody? No, except me. My motivation is to really make sure that I get it burnt into my head, but also that I uh, can share what has really transformed my life. I mean, the passion for Buddhism, it was reluctant. I hated it. I hated coming into Buddhism. I'll tell you the story later. It was a painful experience. I 
kicked and screamed, meeting these people that were like all pissed out and whatever, and I was angry at them. I didn't want to see Geshe, Gishi, Geshe, whatever. <laughs> Seriously, you know? I had all this pushback. It was like someone was dragging me through a door, and everyone was like, come in, Gishi, Michael. I'm like, <laughs> and then my life just went. You know, um, and so I'm still reluctantly trying to make it something meaningful. Gido, does everybody know what Gido means? No, no. Garbage in, garbage out. Good in, good out. So whatever you're taking in, your, whatever the state of mind you're in while you're listening that relates to those motivation is what you're getting out. So that drawing of you, that'll become you later. Yeah? Can really have fire on top of your head, or it can be made of garbage, or it can be made of amazing, blissful, whatever you want to make it. Yeah? It really depends on your state of mind while you're listening. It's true about everything, but particularly about this stuff, because this stuff gets so deep into your heart, if you're listening with the right motivation, that you can transform a life in the short time that we've got on the planet, yeah? And relating to each other. What you'll take away is what you'll put in, but most importantly, it's an opportunity for action. You can come to a class, listen to stuff. I mean, I know my accent is excellent, yeah? It's, it's, so, good. it's so good. No. Uh, have fun, meet each other, whatever. Go back to your life and leave it exactly the same. You know? It's like, it's like we're trained to be in in a state of being in this planet where, you know, we go and watch news and do this and do that and go to work and we accept it. Like cows to the slaughter. They don't know that they can just walk away, you know. They're just stupidly going in to get shot. No question. And we're, we're forever on this planet having these experiences that we're trying to make sense of. But in the meantime, pushed and propelled towards our impending death. Years go past years, decades go past. Look at me, I was 20 last week. <laughs> <laughs> when I, was, I was away from the Three Jewels for like 10 years. I came back, I set up Bob Chip for two or something, yeah? yeah. Day two or something, I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. And then I look at the room and I'm like, I'm the only old dude in here. How come? Because all these faces were beautiful and smiling. And I'm like, I'm the only guy with red hair. Because it's white hair. <laughs> um, so it goes fast. It goes fast. Yeah? It goes really fast. So, make it meaningful. Ritual. I want to make it about personal ritual. There's some people that freak out about ritual. There's some people that dive into ritual. Um, who dives into ritual? Yeah. Who's not too hot for the ritual? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to do the ritual. I just want to talk about one thing with ritual. There's something that happens to your psyche when you do an action. Now, we do rituals all the time. Brush our teeth, do my hair. I mean, look at Mark. Um, <laughs> I miss that ritual. Um, <laughs> the, the, the altar is there for you to use. There is no Buddha in there. Yeah? There's no magic in that space. It's metal stuff with painted stuff but it can be extremely magical for the brains and the minds that go over there and do some kind of thing with their head and their action, knowing that they're doing that to a bunch of metal and feathers and colors. But as they're doing that, that's not going to change. But what's changing is the influence of your mind. You're touching a holy part of you, an incredible part of you, a potential part of you that we don't get to see while we're watching the news, going to work, making breakfast, brushing the teeth, doing the shower, and so on, unless you put your mind to it. So, I highly encourage some of you, those that enjoy, take the opportunity for when you come for these two hours, for the next few weeks, for the, however many you're coming, use the space for ritual. Imagine a border around this place, the outside world somehow cannot get in. Imagine that in your mind, and bring some flowers and cookies, make it special. Robocop action figure, whatever it is for you, <laughs> that gives you that, ah, oh, I'm having fun and I'm enjoying this because I understand that it's not out there something that I'm doing to some special water or whatever. It's what's happening in my mind as I do some watering a bowl or some flour on a vase or, you know, 
decorating that thing or the space. I mean, if you want to bring a deck chair, get done. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, are we clear of why I want to talk about motivation? It really makes a difference. So, focus on that, and I'm going to sort of hopefully bring it back to that as often as I can. I want to tell you a story before we actually begin on the Wheel of Life. 500 BC, imagine it's that long ago, 2,500 years ago, the Buddha was walking on the planet. There's this dude that was a bit sick of what was happening around him, and he was a prince. He had tons of cash and Rolls Royces, you know, and he, uh, he was... He had an experience that made, didn't make him very happy about life and living and the rest. Wanted to figure it out. And to become a Buddha, to wake up, to, um, to see reality behind the, the fabric of the life that we experience is what this dude did. And then he started walking the planet and telling people about it. So around this time, India wasn't India today. Uh, almost of Asia, the kings of the time were more like uh, the Dalai Lama is today. So they had wisdom and compassion as well as ability to manage cash and infrastructure and the rest for the time. And India was divided into 16 great kingdoms. Uh, two of those, the Vatsa kingdom and the Magadha kingdom, and I can't spell or do any of the Sanskrit stuff, so I'm going to pretend you can laugh. Yeah, and me, and I'll, I'll laugh too. Um, so two of these kingdoms were next to each other, and they had some special karma between them. I'm going to tell you how the wheel of life came about. It be, came about because of these two kingdoms. So enlightened dude walking around India, teaching people stuff. These two kingdoms having this symbiotic relationship. And at the time, and still today in India, there's this custom that if somebody gives you something, a gift or something, you should give them something just a tiny bit better. So these two kings, King Vimpasara and King Udrayana, King Udrayana from the Vatsa kingdom, uh, started exchanging gifts. And here it is, that's Udrayana over there. And they're giving each other some gifts. And then it's escalating from, you know, beautiful scrolls and beautiful silks to things with jewels and boxes. And then it got bigger, it got bigger, it got bigger. Um, until... Um, Vimpasara receives a gift from King Udrayana that is almost <coughs> priceless. It's this armor, this magic armor, this special cloth. This special cloth that's supposed to protect you from anything at all. Now, by the way, they're giving stuff to each other so they don't fight each other. So, you know, it's like, oh, piss you, piss you, piss you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't know, I wasn't there, but this is what I was told. But, um, and so the most precious thing, it's jewel encrusted, it's this special armor, it's so light that you could move. Yeah, it's like high-tech stuff. It's like getting an iPad, like, you know, something like that. <laughs> Much better. Um, and so King Vipasara receives this gift from King Udrayana, and he gets a little hot under the collar. It's like, how am I going to give something better than that? You know, so he gets it valued by people that know how to value, uh, value the jewels and the rest, and all his advisors say it's priceless. There's nothing on the planet that, that um, can, can be worth that. Um, and he says, well, something's got to be more precious than this. I've got to return something. So um, none of his advisors can help him. So he dresses up. This is a king in one of the kingdoms. He dresses up as a beggar, and he goes to find a holy man. And he's, you know, he figures, you know, he's a bit of a witch doctor. He'll tell him what to do. Uh, and he asks him, what could be more precious? Is there anything on the planet more precious than this armor I just received from Udrayana down the road? Um, and he says, well, I really don't know, but I'll tell you who will know. There's this dude called the Buddha who's enlightened and can see everything. Go see him. He'll tell you uh, if there is anything under the sun that's more precious than this thing. So King uh, Bimpasara decides to remove the beggar clothing and dress up as a king again and go forth, sends his uh, search, search army to go look for the Buddha, finds the Buddha. Then he goes with his retinue, whatever, with 
stuff. Um, and comes to the Buddha and says, I've received this thing. Uh, it's this precious armor from the King Udrayana. Is there anything on the planet more precious than this? It protects me from poisons. I mean, it's, it's priceless. The Buddha looks at it and says, yes, there is. There's one thing. There's just one thing more precious than that. And the King Vipasaka says, well, what is it? And the Buddha says, it's a picture of me. <laughs> Why don't you send him a picture of me? <laughs> Which I thought was fair. Um, so, you could, uh, something magical will happen to King Udrayama if you send him a picture of me, an image of me. Now, this dude is enlightened. He's figured out reality. No more pain. Yeah? No more figuring out what's happening around you. This dude's the Buddha. He's total omniscient being. So, no problem, they get some artists and they get um, to work and he goes back to his castle, kingdom or whatever it is. Uh, and a couple of weeks go past and there's no news from the camp where the Buddha's being painted. And so, he sends a, a messenger to check things out. The messenger comes back and says, um, you better come, it's important. So the king goes. And the painters who are supposed to paint the Buddha are standing like that unable to do a single stroke for two weeks because he's so beautiful and so magnificent and so made that nobody can, they can't do anything because they, he is so magnificent to look at. So this is a problem and the Buddha says, well, that can help you. I've got an idea. Why don't you get a big, big canvas, a big sheet of cloth. We'll put some lamps behind me at night and we'll project an image of me, a silhouette, and you'll your painters can do a silhouette, and then I'll tell them how to fill in the details later. That's a great idea that begins to happen. And the Buddha, uh, after a couple of weeks of, of that being done, and the Buddha instructing the painters on what to paint, uh, the king comes and says, this is fantastic, your portrait is beautiful, we love it. The Buddha goes, yeah, but it's not quite finished. For something special to happen to King Udrayana, we need uh, a few more details. So, um, he, <laughs> that's where the Buddha ended up. And this is the details that he put in. <laughs> Just a little few details. I don't know how. From, I mean, it must have been a really big canvas, right? But this is in the sutras from, you know, the time that say this is what happened, you know? Um, and so the, the Buddha uh, instructed the artist to fill in all the stuff. And over time, the Buddha just became smaller and smaller and smaller and ended up there. We'll talk about why and what that means later on. <laughs> So the story is that they, he dispatches the gift. You know, they, it's a big, huge canvas. They roll it up, magnificent painted, put it in. You know, like those Russian dolls that go dolls, dolls, dolls. They put it in a, in a chest that puts it in another chest, a big chest of gift. That was a joke. Um, and sends it to King Udrayana. We because it's the most precious thing on the planet. King Vimpasara decides that he'd better send his army to protect this precious gift. So off goes the army of King Vimpasara towards King Udrayana's kingdom and castle. So King Udrayana's looking out the window, I'm sure that's exactly what happened, and he sees an army coming towards him from King Vimpasara. <laughs> and he gets a little nervous and he thinks, I should dispatch my army. How dare he, after the gift I gave him, come and attack me. Yeah? So his ministers convince him not to attack back, not to retaliate. Let's meet him halfway and see what happens. So off goes King Udrayana to meet King Vimpasara and his army, the two armies together. And they quickly realize it's not an attack, but it's an exchange of gifts. It's a return of gifts. But because it's out in the open, a whole bunch of regular folk like you and me are around. And they see the two kings, and it's a big deal, and they talk about it in the television news for not after. Um, <laughs> but they open the present there and there, the gift. They open right there and there. And it gets unrolled in front of everybody. And because the local folk know about the Buddha, they see this magnificent image of the Buddha, and they all bow down. All the armies bow down or the plebs bow down, or the publicans, or whatever you call them. Except King Udrayana, he 
doesn't know what's going on. He's like, what's this Buddha thing? What's this Buddha? He doesn't understand that he's hypnotized by the image. The image has got this image. It's got something for him. Yeah? And so uh, it's, it's written that he takes it back and he spends all night not sleeping, looking at it. Looking at it and looking at it. Looking at the circular motion, looking at the image of the Buddha. And something starts to happen in him. Something awakens in him. And by the morning, he, re he sits in meditation. He gets this sense that he should sit in meditation. And he comes to a point where he sees emptiness directly upon seeing this image. And he becomes an Arya. An Arya is someone who's seen emptiness directly. We can talk about that in subsequent classes. But he becomes this special type of being after being exposed to the content on this very same image that's in front of you. Yet something shifts in his perception of reality that wakes him up. Soon after, he uh, enters a state of nirvana, lets go of his kingdom, gives it off to his son, and goes follows the Buddha for the rest of his life as a lay person, studying with the Buddha, and trying to figure out uh, how to help other beings and the rest. So it was like a letter bomb to the consciousness of King Udrayana at the time. He was the first victim for this bomb that went off in his consciousness. And it's the content of this letter bomb uh, we'll get to uncover bit by bit uh, over, the, over the next couple of weeks. So I was thinking, what does that mean for us? You know, what does it mean for today? What kind of ultimate, what, what did I write there? The ultimate blueprint. Yeah? This wheel of life is the ultimate blueprint to see, to have a conscious experience of something, an experience of a consciousness that's not like the one we're having now. What would it be like today if somebody had to figure out a blueprint to the most intense instrument that could tell us the nature of reality? So I did some research and I found this, today's wheel of life. It's the Large Hadron Collider. That's what we're going to talk about. Have you heard of the Halal yeah. Hadron Collider? Yeah. No. yeah. No, it's the most advanced scientific instrument and the biggest in the world. Ten billion dollars to build. It's that big under Geneva. It's this tunnel. It's actually supposed to smash particles together to get to the moment just after the Big Bang. This is today. Yeah. In what? 2007, we were supposed to collide to the human world. We're supposed to, you know about the Hadron Collider? You're a scientist. <laughs> so I don't know anything about it other than yeah. It's a particle accelerator. A particle accelerator. There yeah. we go. And it's you say layman's terms. I'm not talking Good, good, good. It's a huge thing <laughs> to get two particles to smash together, scientists, so they can look at how the big bang. big bang happened. The idea of the big bang, the theory of the big bang, can be proven. Ideally, like hypothetically, if this huge, I mean, this is a massive ton set of tunnels, this, this has got tubes underneath, you'll see it in a second, that smash particles together, and then they can trace what these particles do, and based on that, you can have a sense of what happened just after the idea of the Big Bang. You see the earliest particles. Yeah, yeah the, the smallest. The smallest, because earliest they, particles. The collision so intense that they separate into like the Smallest the smallest possible, particle. yeah, the smallest particle, which, so this is how the Western world today is trying to figure out the ultimate blueprint of what's happening around the universe and everything around us. We're spending $10, mil, $10 billion, this is the big tube underneath Geneva, yeah? What I love about it, it's got the 12 links of dependent origination <laughs> already in there. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> but think about it. We go to this extreme to figure out what the hell is going on around this universe of ours. Yeah? And what if we find that smallest particle? Surely it can, it can be divided into a <laughs> left side and a right side. But I figured that out a long time ago.
So <laughs> this is another picture yeah, of this uh, theory of everything. Actually, let me read you a, um, a quote from one of the scientists. He goes, we have the outrageous ambition to understand the world around us. If it is successful, the Large Hadron Collider could open the door to a complete understanding of the entire thing around us and every, and even help yield the ultimate goal of physics, a theory for everything. Yeah, This is the theory for everything. We've spent $10 billion and there was a panic when this got built that it would create a black hole and we would all get sucked into the black hole and the world would end and whatever. Yeah? What I found extremely interesting about this is that we humans are investing this much energy in, into figuring out from here out what's going on. Yeah? From consciousness out what's going on to the infinite reaches of space. Yeah? So this is, uh, you were looking, uh, Yovitsa, you were looking for in and out experience, right? This is the perfect example of the out experience. Yeah? <laughs> This is like a gone crazy out experience. Now we've got technology <laughs> and the rest, like, let's figure out what's out there. But when we get to the edge of there, surely there's one more step you can take, right? Or when you get to the smallest particle, surely you can go half of that smallest particle, right? But anyway, let's spend 10 billion dollars. So I figured, let's talk about the wheel of life, because it looks like the bloody wheel of life. <laughs> and <laughs> it's wow. got the six realms already. You know, it's got, it just was perfect, it's circular, yeah. Did they do it? Did they? No, yeah. this is yeah. back to, they run the machine. They ran yeah. the machine in 2007, they had a faulty test run. We can go and research on it, we didn't die yet, yeah. But they haven't <laughs> successfully done it yet. Yeah, yeah. 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 they did a success, they, yeah. they busted they up the particle. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. Okay. But we don't know everything, everything just yet, okay. yeah. They didn't do a full battle. Still right. searching for the Still searching for everything. the biggest theory of everything. But I wanted to, to talk about this because this is how we work in life. You know, we go outside and look at, you know, why is that happening to me out there? Yeah, rather than who is perceiving what's happening to me out there, which is what the wheel of life is hinting at, and then ends up talking about it in detail. So we'll get to talk about that, um, why, why the content of the wheel of life is still relevant today. It answers these questions. What's in the universe? Whose universe? My universe. Yeah? It, it transformed the consciousness of a king 2,500 years ago, immediately after the Buddha, and many human beings that didn't become human beings thereafter, many of which are in the lineage of teachers that have taught people that have brought this information to this room today. So we got it from this dude called Geshe Michael Roach. Geshe, you know? Um, We've got it from Tenso Rinpoche, both verbally and written. We've got it from um, Trishan Rinpoche, one of the teachers of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We've got it from Pavanka Rinpoche. And it's the, this transmission of verbal understanding, like you're going to get now, based on some images and text, has been traced right back to the time of the Buddha. So you're getting something that's very unique and maybe not taught in every Dharma center. Yeah, to this degree. You can get generalizations of the will of life, but you're not probably not going to get such specific detail that's both verbal and written as you're going to get today, hopefully. So the the inside versus outside, I mean there's this beautiful Buddhist thing that's in the cup. Have you all seen the movie The Cup? It talks about the outside and the inside. It's one of the things that really hit me about this thing, the wheel of life, it looks about the thing experiencing the universe, that you that experiences the universe. Transform that and you can figure out the particles and you can figure out the edge of the space. Um, but this saying in, in Buddhism that, you know, this world is so rugged and it's a metaphor for, you know, the sharp rocks and the sharpness that cuts your feet as you walk this planet. Wouldn't it be amazing if we can find enough leather to cover the entire surface of the planet? That's outwardly. You can go and cover the entire planet with leather. Um, but you could cover your feet in leather inwardly, yourself. And it doesn't matter where you walk on the planet. It won't hurt you. This is what the Wheel of Life is doing versus the Large Hedron Collider. Looking outside, <laughs> covering the world with leather. Looking inside covering my feet, myself, with leather. If I've got leather on my feet, it doesn't matter where I walk, it will 
not have. And it's a lot cheaper on the budget. Um, so, what's this wheel of life? We're going to go through, in your booklet, I'll put the four noble truths. Is everybody familiar with the four Ariel truths or four noble truths? Anybody not? Yeah. Okay. It's one of the codes that's hidden in the, in the wheel of life. Um, and it talks a lot about suffering. So for those of you who are, now you're going to get, to begin to get a sense of what the images mean. And over the next six weeks, we'll cover in detail what this really means for us. Yeah, but today you're just going to get a taste of what we'll cover over the next six weeks. So the first truth is that uh, the truth of suffering, that life is suffering. Doesn't matter what goodnesses we have, doesn't matter how handsome or beautiful you are, how young, how healthy, how much money, how many clothes, how much jobs, how many relationships. It changes, it goes away. There's the three sufferings, the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, and all pervasive suffering it happens to every single one of us. I mean, I had an experience today, I'm looking at an old dude walking down the street and I'm imagining myself becoming that. You know, and I used to never think I was going to become that. None of us want to be that. The dude couldn't walk properly. He wanted to, I'm sure. He really wanted to. And so the first noble truth is depicted by this monster. We'll talk about the monster in detail. He's Mr. Death, he's Yama. Uh, if we did a Wheel of Life in the West, it'd be the Green Reaper. Yeah. Um, and also, the suffering is experienced in, those, in that inner circle, the realms. Five, six realms. There's five realms, really, uh, in the original sutra. Two of them, one of them is divided into two. Sub-realms. We'll get into detail about that. So when you see the painting, you know the monster and that part that's colored in is suffering. The first noble truth, the first aerial truth. The second aerial truth, this is the first stuff the Buddha spoke when he uh, became enlightened and taught, was that there is a cause to that suffering. It didn't happen for no reason. It didn't happen... Yeah? I'm sorry. Where was the first suffering located again? The, the core suffering is this red dude. Is Yama, he kills everybody. He's called death, yeah? And everybody locked into this inner circle, which are realms of experience, the human realm is in there, and we'll talk about it in detail. Every one of those beings is experiencing these sufferings, the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, and all pervasive suffering. We'll talk about that in more detail. I just want to get a flavor now. What it's saying is whatever hurt you're feeling right now, even if it smells like a beautiful rose, yeah? If I keep smelling this rose, it'll turn to a shitty smell soon more. It'll rot and it'll be stinky. It won't be nice. At the moment, it's very nice. Yeah? Everything is like that. Everything we experience is like that. It changes. That's the suffering of change. Yeah? The suffering of suffering is every hurt. The hurtful things that you hear people say of you. A cut on your body. A pain somewhere. That's the suffering of suffering. And all pervasive suffering is Mr. Death. As soon as we are born, we are guaranteed to die. There's, there's no getting out of that in this realm of existence. Unless you figure out what King Udrayana figured out. Yeah, we'll talk about that. What about the suffering of birth? Um, the suffering of birth is included in all pervasive suffering. Yeah, it means as soon as you're born, you die. We're okay with that? We'll cover it in way more detail. I just want to give you a high-level overview today before we go, so you know what you're in for, and you can see where you can connect to the stuff that's meaningful for you. Yeah? What you came to, to look for, and hopefully you'll find it in one of these images. So we'll spend a day, one of the days, on Mr. Death and the realms. Yeah? And what that means to be in a human existence, or an animal existence, and the rest. Those hurts that we feel, the dissatisfactions, they're not liking myself in the mirror, they're getting upset at the job, they're getting angry at the relationships, they're hurting my toe, all the way up to aging and dying, all of those are, are caused by something. In the West, in scientific West, we say everything has a cause, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And one of the first things I got from Geshe Gishi, Geshe Michael Roach, right, was, um, how come we in the West don't think that our experience of the world has a cause? 
You know, when we start asking questions at the age of five from mum and dad and that are difficult to, to ask, you know, why did auntie such and such get cancer, who was such a nice lady, but the old bag down the road who's such a terrible person didn't, you know, in fact, she just won $10 million or whatever. How come that happens? So those difficult questions in the West, we say, stop asking stupid questions, yeah? And there is no answer to that in the West. However, in this idea, every, every suffering, every hurt, every experience of dissatisfaction must be caused by something. So either things are caused or not caused. We'll talk about that in detail. We'll spend more than a day in the 12 links of dependent origination. So when you look at this reef on the outside, that is what causes suffering. The monster, Mr. Death, is holding everybody in that ring. Everybody in that ring must suffer those sufferings. There's no escaping it if you are in this existence. If you're inside that ring, you're hurting. And the core, the three icons in the middle, the pig, the chicken, and the snake, are the engine that drive that wheel around the suffering and suffering and suffering. This is a continuous cycle of cause and effect and cause and effect for every single hurt, every single disappointment, everything that is distasteful to you. And I, when I say suffering, I don't just mean hatred and hurting and the rest. I'm talking about the slightest dissatisfaction with the heat in the room. That's not happening, yeah? Um, I get that, but why are those animals? Yeah, we'll explain a good yeah, they're called the three poisons and they are the cause of the the engine that drives this machine of our experience. Are you gonna get into that? Maybe? Yeah. Okay. Totally. I'm gonna enjoy yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Totally. So don't forget, I'm just giving you a quick flavour. If you understand the four aerial truths, next time you see the painting you know that they're locked in here. You're just unlocking now the four. Can I ask you one more yeah. Why are you calling them aerial truths? I've never good. heard of referred like that. Uh, yeah. Aria. 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 Because an Aria, yeah, a person who has seen emptiness directly becomes an Aria. Uh, we'll talk about that too at a later time. It is actually the experience you have after you come out of that state of meditation. We'll talk about that towards the end of the class, hopefully. You, um, you have an experience of these four truths, these four noble truths. The translation, from uh, when it came from the Hindu or Tibetan to to the West, people said noble, but really it means Aryu. That's oh, why we're saying it. Okay. So you're getting a deeper understanding of the true translation. Okay. Yeah, they're not noble as in, oh, I'm having some great realization. It actually is forced on you because of the experience you had of seeing emptiness directly. You must experience these four realities as soon as you come out. You look at the world and you go, I've never had a solid experience in this world. My God, we are all suffering more than I ever thought we were. Up until that point, you have a sense that everybody else is hurting like you do. After that experience, you know, without doubt, that there is suffering in every single being you look at. And then you have a realization of the causes of that, that there is a cause for that suffering. These 12 links of dependent origination, this, this cycle that we keep doing in our lives, you try it again and you try it again and you try it again. It's funny because you keep meeting the same type of people, doesn't matter where you go, right? They give you as much hurt as the last type of person you met. Yeah, I'll tell you about my friend Gary. Uh, and then the engine that turns that thing, uh, these three animals, yeah, I'll tell you about them. It's great, it's a great metaphor, yeah? They call them three poisons. Um, and they are the thing that, um, that drives this continuous cycle, both the big cycle of living and dying and living and dying and living and dying in all these realms, to the tiny cycle of, I don't like you, you don't like me, I hate you, hate me, I punch you, you punch me, I punch you, you punch you. Yeah? Those tiny cycles, yeah? I hang up on you, you hang up on me. <laughs> yeah? Those tiny, tiny cycles. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You, the next experience you have is that that can be stopped. It doesn't have to be that way. There, you can stop that suffering. It can permanently be stopped. In fact, that's what the Buddha is. Yeah? Uh, so that's what the Buddha did. He got out. So he's pointing to the moon. The moon, in the original sutra, in the original painting, the one that the Buddha 
directed people to pain. It wasn't a moon. It became a moon over time, interpretation after interpretation. It was just a clear white orb. Perfection. It was nirvana. That's how suffering ends. There is no suffering in nirvana. Do you know the definition of nirvana? Louder? Oh, it's the direct, it's the permanent cessation of all your mental afflictions. The and permanent cessation of all your mental afflictions. And their backtracks are their seeds. And their seeds. Due to the direct realization, like your own personal realization of emptiness. I think. Due to your own realization of emptiness. Exactly what happened to King Udraya. Yeah? He jumped out of this realm of existence, out into what the moon represents. It represents a transformation of consciousness where he was in nirvana. Yeah, he is in nirvana. We talk about that as well in detail. Yeah? You're enlightened. Yeah. There's nirvana and there's Buddha. You're enlightened and there's like, yeah, Buddha. So we'll talk about that too. The next thing is these verses. This is this is the code that unlocks or fuses this bomb to go off. We'll talk about that. In fact, they're at the back of your booklet. I can't remember if I put them in Tibetan. I did. That's the purpose, so you figure it out. Yeah? <laughs> and <laughs> but the moon and that means the suffering can stop. Yeah? So, so far, I'm just going to recap with you. The first noble truth is that things are crap. They turn to crap. Yeah? They hurt. We die. Things turn to crap. Yeah? So that's inside every one of these realms, the animal realm, whether you're an animal or a human, and all these other beings that are locked inside this wheel are caught by Mr. Death. You will die. And that's like the highest of all the hurts that go in between birth and then. So we are locked inside this, this experience of suffering. That's what the, those two mean. That has a cause. That didn't just happen. And this outside ring is the cycle that keeps those hurts coming. Both the big cycle of life and death, and life and death forever going on, and the core of it, the engine that drives it, the three mental states, that's what they represent, that force us to experience this suffering. That suffering can stop. It can end. You can reach a state of enlightenment. You can get to nirvana. Now, it's not some place out there. It's a transformation of consciousness. It's a thing that happens to you here. It's not you're going to go off to Nirvana heaven. Yeah? Now, we have a challenge in the West. We grew up and we're still growing up with these ideas around us that counter this. And so if you could be aware of that for the time that you're here to try and challenge those, think those thinkings and try and look at the world through a different point of view, I'll encourage you throughout the course because there's a different view about reality in here than the one we grew up with. We grew up with a prejudice about the way things work that we think is true. In fact, that's one of the things that keeps us cycling. We'll talk about that in class three. And the fourth aerial truth or noble truth is that there is a path to end that suffering. There's a way to end it. Yes, we can get to Nirvana, but there's some stuff you've got to do. You can't go shopping every other day, watch TV, let the TV tell you you suck, so you have to go and work some more to earn more money to go shopping. Yeah? That's a beautiful cycle. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it is a, it's a beautiful American cycle, a Western cycle in general, right? You work really hard because that's what we do here. And you want to buy shoes. <laughs> the shoes are nice. Mm. Oh my God, shoes. Yeah? Um, and so you, you're exhausted from working. You've spent all your money shopping, so you come home and watch some TV and all the commercials are telling you you suck because you haven't got the latest shoes. And so you've got to go get more money to stop feeling like you suck. So you, you can go buy more shoes, which means you've just spent the money you just earned. Blah, 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 blah. So the more, yeah, it's a beautiful cycle. The more the job, the couch. The more the job, the couch. All the job, the couch. Yay, we had a Friday night. Let's get drunk. Um, that's another story. So, the, sorry, I got distracted there. 
the Buddha points to the path. He talked about the Eightfold Path. He talked about the 37 somethings to enlightenment, factors of enlightenment, the six perfections, the ten parameters. There's all these paths. He's taught many ways to get out of this wheel to a state of being where you don't hurt at all. The permanent cessation of every mental affliction. affliction. It means nothing disturbs you. Now, it's not like you sit there with people prodding at you and you can tolerate it because you're all blissed out. It's not that. Mm -hmm. You don't even experience that they're hurting you. That's what Nirvana means. We'll talk about that in a minute more. So when you see the Buddha in the painting, here's the fourth noble truth, the fourth aerial truth. So already you've learned something about the painting. Yeah? Yes. Good. Well, so what's the second noble truth? Oh, source of suffering. Wait, where is that? It's the, 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 the 12 point. Five, yeah, it's the outside that. circle and so what drives it. And the, the three. Core. The core. That's the engine. Awesome. Okay. What's the first aerial truth? The first uh, noble truth? Suffering. 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 What's depicted here? Lord Death. Mr. Death and the six all realms, people. yeah, and all the people and beings that exist. Excellent. Okay, so let's talk death for a second. Mm. Yeah. Should we have a break? Yeah. 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 Sorry. There's refreshments, and they take 15 minutes, and then come back, and that's a good transition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stop broadcast or stop? Yeah. And when you press stop that, that'll